Noor Adekat is a human rights attorney and activist. She is currently an Abraham L. Friedman Teaching Fellow at Temple University, Beasley School of Law, and the US-based legal advocacy consultant for the Badil Resource Center for Palestinian Refugees uh, and Residency Rights. She has taught international human rights law in the Middle East at Georgetown University since spring 2009. Noor is a co-editor of Jadaliya's Occupation, Intervention, and Law, OIL, page. Upon completing her JD, Noura was awarded a New Voices Fellowship with the US campaign to end the Israeli occupation, where she helped seed BDS campaigns nationally across communities and university campuses. Badil, the organization she is representing, is, resource, is, is the, a resource center for Palestinian residency and refugee rights, um, and it is an independent, community-based, nonprofit organization working to defend and promote the rights of Palestinian refugees and IDPs. Badil emerged in 1998 out of a series of popular refugee conferences in the West Bank and Gaza Strip. Uh, Badil's vision, missions, programs, and relationships are defined by their Palestinian identity and the principles of international law, in particular international human rights law. They seek to advance the individual and collective rights of the Palestinian people on this basis. You can, they also have a table outside um, which um, there were a number of great free things, which were unfortunately, because they were free, they were almost all taken yesterday. But uh, <laughs> you can feel free to peruse the remainders and, and, um, and uh, see if there's anything left of interest. And then our Liat Rosenberg, who will actually be speaking first, um, is a graduate of Tel Aviv University, where she studied gender studies and majored in sociology and anthropology. She co-established Social TV NGO in Israel and was a board member of the Feminist Women's Rape Crisis Center in Tel Aviv. She is a human rights activist in Israel, where she challenges the Israeli occupation and colonization of Palestine. Rosenberg is currently the director of Zohrot, an NGO that promotes the acknowledgement, accountability, and responsibility of the Israeli public to the ongoing crimes of the Nakba and the return of the Palestinian refugees. As the organization itself uh, describes itself as, uh, it, Zohrot seeks to, to raise public awareness of the Palestinian Nakba, especially among Jews in Israel, who bear a special responsibility to remember and amend the legacy of 1948. Nakba, as many of us know, is an Arabic word that means catastrophe. The Nakba was the destruction, expulsion, looting, massacres, and incidents of rape of the Palestinian inhabitants of this country. It was keeping refugees out by force at the end of the war in order to establish the Jewish state. And it is the ongoing destruction of Palestinian localities, the disregard for the rights of refugees and displaced people, and the prohibition against teaching and commemorating the Nakba in schools and civic groups. So uh, please join me in welcoming our two speakers. So good afternoon, everyone. It's uh, really a privilege to be here. Um, you will see in the background, uh, the presentation is an, a loop of pictures from Zohot's uh, uh, activity. So uh, it's a loop presentation throughout, um, throughout this uh, lecture. Um, I thought to begin with, uh, the concern of, two, of my two sisters, two weeks ago, I told them that I was to come for the first time, this is my first visit in the United States, so I told them that I'm to come to a conference about the return of the Palestinian refugees. Um, of course, they had no idea what I was talking about, uh, because my family is in a complete denial to everything that I do, but their main concern was uh, that when I will present uh, the agenda of Zuchot by saying that uh, we work to promote for the decolonization and desionization of Palestine and the new regime that will uh, enable the return of all Palestinian refugees that you, might, you the crowd, the audience, might mistaken this uh, uh, presentation of mine to be the formal agenda of the state of Israel. So, <laughs> so I just wanted, yeah. So I just wanted to set the agenda clear and for my sister to sleep in peace at night. So, um, 
what I thought of talking today uh, was about these three main issues. The first one I would like to present the political principles of Zuchot as the only NGO working today in Israel with Israeli public as the main target audience um, to promote acknowledgement, accountability, and responsibility for the ongoing crimes of the of the Nakba and for the return of the Palestinian refugees. Then I would like to uh, talk about some of the principles that were discussed and, and then later on published by Zuchot and uh, Badil uh, in two, in, uh, actually in two, uh, three documentation. The most recent one is what we call the Cape Town uh, document with the principles that we conceive to be the principles of the return. And then to talk about some of the strategies, meaning what should happen tomorrow morning after this uh, conference. Now, actually, all of those, these three issues for me is just an attempt to try and answer what is, uh, I think, to be, as an Israeli, one of the most important question, which is, what is the role, if any, of Israelis in talking and promoting the return of the Palestinian refugees issue. And what is our mandate? Because this is a question that we often find ourselves asking at Zuchot, um, uh, as some people might say, and, and I could agree with that, not only are we the colonizers, are we going to colonize the space of talking about the return of the Palestinian refugees? So I think that it is very important for me, uh, for you to bear in mind that although that I wanted to say that I have good news and I have bad news, that the good news that I am, it's very uh, hard to say that, but the good news is that I am an Israeli and as such I could try and shed some light on how Israelis perceive the right of return. And I think what would be more interesting is how uh, Israeli organization that is working to promote the right of return uh, is perceiving the return. And the bad news, of course, and it seems much natural for me to say that, is that I am still an Israeli. And everything that I'm going to say and present is limited and bound by the fact that as radical as I may be, I am still limited to the conceptions of uh, the colonizers. And the strategies that Zuchot uses are often, we often find ourselves uh, struggling with what strategies are uh, those that are part of the privilege that we have as Israelis. So uh, in order to uh, perhaps be more ex explicit about the questions uh, in hand for an Israeli organization, I would like to quote um, Yoni Ashpal, who was a speaker, one of the key speakers, in a conference that took place about five years ago in 2008. It was a conference that Zohot organized uh, quite similar to this about the return of the Palestinian refugees. And there are two paragraphs that really uh, catched my eyes because he really success successfully uh, described the question in hand. And he says the following things. Oh, I'm sorry, it's not working. Okay, okay, it's ready. Okay. And he says the following things. Uh, it's in Hebrew, I'm going to translate it simultaneously. Um, Even without knowing what the future holds, one can determine that the return could be implemented in one of these two ways. The first one is by forcing it on the Jewish Israeli public, and the second one is with its consent, meaning the consent of the majority of the Israeli public. Now, many today think that only by means of uh, pressure, meaning um, military, economic, uh, politically, or international pressure, 
One can force Israel to end the ongoing occupation in Nakba and to change its discriminating nature against the Palestinians, thus enable the return of the Palestinian refugees. So in this first paragraph, I think it's the first part of the question in hand, which is, um, what is the place of the Israeli public in the issue of return of the Palestinian refugees? Should we force it on Israeli public? Or should we, uh, in some ways, and we have to think hard and creatively about in what ways we can uh, achieve and gain the consent of the majority of Israeli public in order to enable uh, the return of the Palestinian refugees. Now, the second paragraph, uh, he asks, um, how would a return would look like if it's forced uh, up upon millions of people? Can one force millions of people to absorb millions of other into the society. What kind of a society will we have? And is this a vision of reconciliation or is this a vision of a civil war? Now, um, the words, there are certain buzzwords like coexistence and peace and reconciliation that are, uh, I really don't like to use because I think that they are so, uh, so washed and to use the words are um, uh, often uh, the person, people who use them are those who have the privileges to have reconciliation. But uh, a few months ago, when we had to discuss in Zuchot about what sort of uh, return we as Israelis uh, perceive to see, uh, a question was raised uh, in a group of Israelis and Palestinians. And it was an hypothetical question. The question was, let's assume that uh, tonight, if you will, the UN Security Council would announce of the return of the Palestinian refugees. Would that be good? Would that mean that we have uh, achieved our goals? And the following, uh, it was a very uh, complex and long discussion um, because we had to uh, really discuss what kind of a return would it be if it is very sudden without the proper uh, st uh, infrastructure and without a proper uh, preparation of Israeli society. So uh, the following principles were drafted. The first one is that it is very obvious and uh, it is very obvious for Zachot that the ground zero of the conflict, the conflict, if you can call it that, between Israelis and Palestinians um, is the Nakba of 48. Uh, and therefore, the return is the inevitable readdress of those ongoing uh, crimes. And we can perceive it to be the only chance for just res resolution and long-lasting peace between Israelis and Palestinians. Um, now, in Israel today, um, Professor Yudah Shenhav wrote, is an Israeli professor, and he wrote in his recent publication, in the, the name of the book was In the Trap of the Green Lines, he says that the majority of Israelis uh, today perceive the baseline for the conflict to be uh, the 67 event. The 48, the Nakba, is uh, a way off the discourse and at best could be addressed to as an historical uh, event that is long, long in the past. Now, even Israelis, NGOs, uh, Israeli human rights organization and peace organizations today that deals with the occupation and directly deal with uh, the refugees themselves, uh, even them are going back to 67 and the issue of 48 is very, very, uh, is very, very delicate because of the issue of the return. Because if we have to, assume, if we have to acknowledge uh, 
the Nakba, then we have to assume responsibility. And if we have to assume responsibility, we just might find ourselves having to let them, meaning the refugee, to return. And then the meaning is the bare destruction of Israel as we know it. So this is the discourse uh, in Israel. Now, the, the second principle that we've all agreed on is that we believe that the end of the conflict uh, is not just, uh, it's, it's not just the actual uh, return, it's, uh, it, will, it will demand the creation of a new society, of a new regime, and that the change will come only after the current regime and after the country, uh, meaning Israel, uh, would be decolonized and de-Zionized, enabling all its inhabitants and refugees to live together without the threat of expulsion or denial of return. Now, what kind of regime will that be? This is an entirely different uh, story. And today, many we have many uh, models of um, how the state, how, how the new regime uh, could look like. But this is a subject that should be more researched and talked about of the possibilities be, uh, uh, beside the two-state solution that is so, uh, is really the main discourse uh, today in Israel. Now, the next principle is the return as a multidimensional process. Now, at Zohot, we envision the return as an extended and multidimensional process which includes not only the physical return of refugees to this country, uh, to the new country, or to the new regime, but also the appropriate and dignified integration in an equal joint Palestinian uh, uh, Jewish society. And under this extensive view, return, be uh, return begins long before the actual and physical return, and there is the phase of the actual return itself, but then there is the phase of the after, the actual return itself, the new society, the new culture, the new economic, the new agriculture, the new that relationship between the uh, Palestinians and, uh, and Jews in Palestine. And the next and last uh, principles is that uh, how this process of a multidimensional uh, return could be implemented. And in the document that was published by both Zohot and Badil, uh, we addressed the readdressing of the crimes of the ongoing Nakba and the injustices that were that suffered by Palestinians victims of the Zionist coloni colonialism and state violence to be a multi-tiered process that entails several and different and parallel mechanisms based on principles of transitional justice. Now, when we talked about transitional justice in the document, uh, what we, uh, the, um, uh, how we defined the transitional justice approach was in its broadest term, meaning the way that societies deal with the past and present, moving from a repressive regime to a democratic uh, on the base of recognition, responsibility, and redress. And in the case of Israel-Palestine, uh, it means that the process should uh, pay attention to the ongoing crimes since 48 until the occupation today as we know it, and moving from the repressive regime since 48 to a new regime that will be after uh, the actual return, when we uh, take into consideration that these uh, uh, the principles of the transitional justice is a victim-based approach. And we were talking about uh, three main elements, uh, which are um, usually, uh, the terms are truth, justice, and readdress, but we've uh, adjusted it to recognition, uh, accountability and responsibility, and readdress. Uh, 
So when we're talking about uh, the first element, which is recognition, is the first component of transitional justice in the case of the Palestinian and Israel conflict, relates to uh, recognizing and acknowledging, meaning by Israelis, uh, of the injustices suffered by Palestinians victims of the Zionist uh, colonialism and state violence during the Nakba of 48, but as well as the continuing injustices, meaning the occupation, the colonization and apartheid, uh, and all the other layers, layers of violation. Now, it's very important to emphasize because in Israel, even when talking about the Nakba and the uh, 48, uh, we, the, the usual, uh, even by more progressed uh, Israelis, uh, they usually talk about 48 as an historical event that is 65 years ago in the past. And one of these principles in that recognition and exposing the truth is to create uh, the continuous time-wise, meaning not to detach 48 from the occupation today as we know it, but to, sh uh, to present it as an ongoing uh, process. Now, um, when we're talking about the truth, uh, we talk about that knowing the truth is a right and recognition of the truth is a right, not only for the individuals, meaning the uh, Palestinian victims, uh, and of course the Palestinian society as a whole to have a right for the truth about uh, the atrocities to be exposed, but also for Israelis to uh, know the truth about uh, the history and about the violence that their collective has caused uh, for the past uh, 65 years. Um, and repressive regimes like Israel deliberately rewrite history and deny atrocities to legitimize themselves. So we can see, and for Zachot, this is the main core of our activities in exposing the truth about the ongoing crimes of the Nakba. Um, what we see in Israel, that for the past 65 years, the state of Israel and the public is deliberately uh, rewriting the history and erasing any memory of what happened in uh, 48. We can see the erasing from the landscape and space, and therefore one of our project is the tours that we have to the destroyed Palestinians' neighborhood, villages, uh, and towns in order to expose the truth. We work with educators and with uh, schools, with students, with universities in order to expose the truth about what happened in uh, 48. Um, now, um, the, most pro the, the reason why the truth is very important in, in light of the first question that I presented, which is, what is the role of Israelis in the uh, return of the Palestinian refugees? Under this paradigma, uh, the understanding is that if the return would happen to a society that has no recognition and no knowledge, nonetheless no acknowledgement of what happened in the past, then uh, the, uh, the fear is that the uh, society and the public would just return to the same patterns of violence that he, it used to for the past uh, 65 years. So the most problematic is uh, recognition on an individual level because one cannot force other to recognize anything by force if they chose not to. And achieving such individual recognition takes time and a great deal of effort and time and effort is, of course, a privilege of colonizers. We have uh, a long, long time. And uh, as my friend Omar, and my colleague Omar, uh, when we talked about, uh, when we had a discussion, what if the return of the Palestinian refugees would happen today? And uh, we had a very complex discussion, and we said that the return of the Palestinian refugees should happen as a gradual and multi-dimensional process based on 
uh, elements of truth, accountability and responsibility, he said what I really agreed with, do we really have to wait until, what is the latest number, 6.5 or 7 million Jewish Israelis would acknowledge and uh, come to terms with the fact that they committed those terrible crimes and uh, uh, know, know the truth and uh, assume their responsibility. Do we really have to wait for that? So um, I'm, I'm presenting those principles, but I'm also presenting the complexity and the problems that uh, are attached to that. Now, the second element is the element of uh, justice and what we call responsibility and accountability. Because when we talk about the truth, we talk about only the very basic layer of knowing the truth about ha what happened. And uh, we're talking about the knowledge aspect. And the second layer, of course, is the acknowledgement. So, uh, the responsibility or the acknowledgement or the justice part relates to holding those who are responsible, meaning the Zionist regime or the public in Israel, uh, responsible for the Nakba and the uh, violations that uh, pre preceded uh, from that to hold them accountable. So when we're talking about uh, justice, the very first uh, uh, the very first element is, of course, to have documentation of all the crimes since '48. And I was, and I, as I was talking with Salman Abusita this morning, uh, Salman, you said that hi. <laughs> you said that the case of the Palestinians are very uh, in opposed to many other cases that we know around the world is very much documented. There is a lot of documentations and archives about the violations since 48 until today. So that would be uh, very useful in case that uh, one would think to use some uh, more formal uh, justice-making mechanism like international tribunals or civil trials and uh, so on. Uh, another form of uh, justice making would be community-based forms. So uh, recently, uh, Zuchot has begun in uh, what we call a public hearing project uh, that is, uh, if you will, it's a civil society uh, project because it has no teeth, meaning we can expose the truth what we mean is to have a uh, to invite Palestinian refugees, let's say from uh, from Lid, to testify on the massacre. We have uh, Zionist fighters from 48 that recently uh, testified on uh, being part of not being part, but shooting the piat to the mosque in Lid and committing the massacre, and to invite them to give their testimonies to have a committee. But other than having a public display or public event, such informal uh, public hearing has no teeth, meaning they cannot really demand that the state of Israel would make a formal apology for the massacre in Lid. I cannot imagine uh, such a thing to happen anytime soon. So, but we have to prepare, and I think that one of the uh, thoughts that we're having at Zuchot, because uh, Zuchot is really a grassroots organization, and we are working we're more in the grassroots uh, level, level. We are not a human rights organization, and we're not working with uh, more advocative or legislative level, but I think that there is a place to think about the legislative level and how uh, as part of human rights aspects, what one can think about using mechanism of uh, gaining justice um, in more formal uh, mechanism. The last part, because I have really a uh, few minutes, uh, is of course one of the most important elements, which is the redress and the actual Return. So there, when we talk about the readdress, uh, 
We're talking about restitution, compensation, um, and other elements like rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantee for non-repetition, which those three last elements, uh, meaning the restitution and compensation part are the part of the actual return itself. Because I was talking about the pre-return, which is making on the Israeli part, making the society more prepared. There is the actual return, which are a mechanism of restitution, compensation, and then there are those elements which are for the after return, which are the rehabilitation, satisfaction, and guarantee. Now, at Zuchot, what we have been doing with uh, Badil in uh, uh, some of the joint action is to try and go into the details, which I know that Noah will speak about more in detail, so I will not get to that, but it's an attempt to really get into the, the details of how, the, what should be the mechanisms of the actual physical return and the actual mechanisms of restitutions. And there are many issues that uh, uh, arise in the discussion, um, some of which are economical aspects of return, uh, community aspects of return, like, for example, if there is a, a community that is in a refugee camp today with other communities, and then they would have to return, for example, uh, they would have to return to their original uh, village from uh, 48. That would mean that the community today would have to be uh, detached one more time. So how to make the return happen as part of the community today because time has passed. What about a community that is returning to the land of 48 and the condition are conditions agricultur agriculturally and economically are much different than those that are today. Uh, some of the main issues that I think we can see that changes in the attitude of Israelis versus Palestinians are in the cases of, I think, uh, there aren't many cases, uh, Salman, I know, because we're talking that about the fact that 80% of the entire land is practically free to go, uh, but what about places like in Yaffa that there are Israeli uh, that are occupying the houses today. Would we evacuate them? We, will we not evacuate them? Uh, and so the discussion is very uh, complex on those matters. And uh, of course, there is the question of compensations. Where, where is the money for the compensations will come from? How can we prepare? for that today, what is the, of course, what is the responsibility of Israel? Is there a responsibility for the British uh, for uh, giving money for the uh, compensation? So I don't have any answers for that, but this is just an example for the question that uh, uh, rises during the uh, discussion. And when we're talking, uh, the last, perhaps the last element, we're, we're talking about guarantee for non-repetition, the main, I think, besides rebuilding the society uh, in order to assure that there will be no repetition of uh, those ongoing crimes is the fact that uh, a new, that the return of the Palestinian refugees would have to be uh, into a new regime. Now, what I didn't talk about, and I think perhaps I will finish that, with that is that most of the discussion took the end of Zionist apartheid, occupation, and colonization as a starting point, uh, while focusing energies on exercises of envisioning a post-Zionist Palestine. So I will end with the question is, how is that going to happen? So I'll, I'll leave the rest of the question to you. Thank you very much.
thank you for this warm invitation. And a very, very special thank you to the organizers, Jamil, Alex, Zena, Max, Raed, and Sophia. Thank you so much. None of this would be possible without the dedication and the tireless work of organizers who don't get to grace these panels and receive your warmth and applause and admiration. And so I want to extend all that to you and all the students who are in fact carrying much of the weight of this very difficult uh, movement here in the United States as they battle against the propaganda machine from the belly of uh, the beast and empire. Um, but thank you. Particularly because we're in the US, we don't have the opportunity to have a discussion about how to implement the right of return and what that would look like. And even by asking the question, we can anticipate, as Liat pointed out, the conflict that would happen between an unwilling society to deal with their supremacist notions of self and privilege and perhaps if we thought about it a bit more, we'll also be confronted with the internecine conflicts amongst Palestinians themselves based on class, based on geography, based on concepts of society, of whether that's a reversion to a society we once knew or a move forward into a society that we can create, which is textured by the reality of a diaspora that now speaks several languages, Portuguese, Spanish, French, English, uh, I'm not sure uh, how many, but I'm, I, I, the, the German, uh, Dutch, we can go on and on, and many of the new generations of Palestinians who are also Palestinian refugees by definition don't speak Arabic. So how do we envision that return? I don't have the answer to that either. However, that's again to emphasize the critical nature of a conference like this. When we can get out of the dictates of what beltway politics and beltway discourse forces us, the language it forces us to use, where the right of return is often little more than a political banner and political grandstanding, when in fact it's a process and it's a human right and it's an obligation and it's necessary for the rehabilitation of a, a, of a refugee population. And although Palestinian refugees are very much objectified in a political conflict, they remain, like all refugees, in critical need of humanitarian rehabilitation as their current exodus and secondary forced displacement from Syria evidences, where they are treated with distinction at the borders of Jordan, for example, from their Syrian refugee counterparts, despite the identical demand and need for refuge that they make. So it's in this universal context that Palestinians lay claim to return to compensation and to restitution, as we all know is established in paragraph 11 of UN Resolution 194. And here I have to say, yes, I am an attorney. Yes, I'm going to use the language of law. No, I don't think it's the panacea to liberation. Not the law, not maps, but in the absence of a national political strategy for liberation. These are tactics that we use and that underscore this, our strategic ability to pave the path in what is a vacuum for a, a coherent strategy. So don't hate me, <laughs> right? Hate the PA, I'm just kidding. Okay, moving on, <laughs> moving on. 
But in addition to UN Resolution 194, this right is embodied in Article 13.2 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, in Article 5.D.2 of the International Convention on the Elimination of Discrimination of All Forms of Discrimination, of Article 12.4 of the International Covenant on the Civil and Political Rights, as well as established in international relations and precedent as evidenced by the comprehensive return of refugees to Bosnia, to East Timor, to Kosovo, and to Rwanda in the aftermath of military conflict. That this right, as well as other durable solutions are denied to Palestinian refugees can be attributed to an international protection gaps that afflicts them, as well as the political impediments that have controlled the Palestinian refugee question and their condition into a protracted refugee crisis, which suspends them in limbo. Perhaps for this reason, we have not had the opportunity, as we do now, as we do this weekend, and hopefully moving forward, uh, to discuss the practicalities of return. And to discuss these practicalities, I'll divide my talk, it hasn't even started, <laughs> into three parts. In the first part, I'll discuss the constitution of a Zionist uh, theory and state that is the greatest impediment to the right of return for Palestinian refugees. In the second part, I'll discuss the vested interests of a Palestinian leadership in a two-state solution, then how that's translated the right of return practically via negotiations as a result of Oslo, and how little that's brought us forward. And in the third part, I'll share with you some of the proposals that Badil, together with Zakhrat, has made. And unfortunately, but not surprisingly, these proposals raise more questions than they do offer answers. And I think that as this uh, conference has already begun to demonstrate, those answers can emerge and can be synthesized, but not in two days here or anywhere else. Any two days anywhere. <laughs> so let's begin from our lovely story that Dr. Salman Abu Sitte, the Tliat, I'm sure that um, Dr. Masad is going to share with us later, the establishment of Israel. Upon its establishment, it passed two laws that privileged, it passed many laws, but two laws in particular that privileged its Jewish inhabitants and further dispossessed and marginalized its non-Jewish indigenous population. The most, those two relevant laws, do I get extra time for drinking water? The Citizenship Law of 1952, which bifurcated Jewish nationality from Israeli citizenship and denationalized the Palestinian population. A critical moment as statelessness under international law renders people absolutely without protection. And so it's no surprise that statelessness today remains the most vulnerable condition. Uh, as Hannah Arendt has said, uh, and I'm paraphrasing, but the most vulnerable condition is to be no more than human, as opposed to being a national. But, and it's no surprise that the Third Reich denationalized the, all of its Jewish population of its German citizenship before it began its, um, its uh, program of massacre. In doing so, the state instantly created a two-tiered system of rights, one available for Jews who could be both nationals and citizens, and one for non-Jews who could be citizens only. The law of return in 1950 then extended the right to Israeli citizenship and to associated state benefits to any Jewish person, now a Jewish national as well, regardless of territorial location. So if you look at this chart, and I'm happy to share it, but what you see is the rights that flow to nationality. And those rights confer particular privilege to Jewish nationals, whether they live within the state, whether they live 
in the occupied territories where they are subject to civil and criminal Israeli law as opposed to the matrix of 1,500 military laws that are uh, imposed upon the rest of the Palestinian population who are without citizenship or nationality at, or to Jewish nationals living abroad. In contrast, you have a myriad ways of treating Palestinian citizens without nationality, without citizenship or nationality at all, in the West Bank, as distinct from their treatment in Gaza, as distinct from their treatment in East Jerusalem, where they are ID holders, as distinct from their treatment in forced exile. Together, these laws ensured that Jewish persons who lived beyond Israel's boundaries, who had no relationship, no relationship to it, had more rights than the state's own non-Jewish Palestinian citizens. The new state was cementing its Jewish demographic majority that its Zionist founders thought necessary to preserve Israel's Jewish character. That's not all. In addition, by instituting a series of similar laws, it also preserved Jewish political, social, and economic privilege. And the purpose of these laws has been to ensure that Palestinians are a minority, are an underclass, and a fragmented population within its society and beyond. Israel's policies aim to diminish the Palestinian population, to geographically concentrate them into ghettos, and to erase their presence physically and metaphysically in an effort to uphold a national mythology regarding its establishment and its existence. In furtherance of its demographic priorities, some of these Israeli policies have had the express purpose of diminishing the Palestinian population within Israel proper. This is most blatantly evidenced by the recent ban on family reunification, which prohibits Palestinian citizens of the state from marrying someone from the occupied territories or someone from Israel's declared enemy states, Iran, Iraq, Lebanon, Syria, um, and I think that's it. That's it. Uh, but not, not coincidentally, those states, with the exception of Iran, have the highest concentration of Palestinian refugees, at least until recently, before the exodus and secondary forced displacement of Palestinians from Iraq in the aftermath of the US's invasion in 2003. In upholding this law, which prevents these Palestinians from marrying their spouses, their counterpart spouses, and living within the state by prohibiting the adjustment of their status in ways that disproportionately impacts the state's Muslim and Christian population. In, two in January 2012, the Israeli High Court uh, declared that, quote, human rights are not a prescription for national suicide. But the threat is not just numeric. It's just as much about competing narratives and memory. At stake is the state's own na national mythology. In 2011, Israel passed the Nekba law, which penalizes any institution that challenges Israel's founding as a Jewish and democratic state or commemorates Israel's Independence Day as one of mourning or loss by revoking state funding. The threat that any such commemoration poses is a challenge to Israel's narrative of righteous conception. Within this state, where the population of approximately 1.2 million Palestinian citizens do not pose a demographic threat, their treatment is no less insidious. And it's not just in the preservation of this demographic majority but it's a project of making sure that they remain ghettoized, of making sure that they remain an underclass, of making sure that their presence is erased uh, in ways that memory 
is the victim. And so just two examples of this. In the Negev today, the Prower Plan proposes, or the Naqab, the Prower Plan proposes to uproot 70,000 Palestinian uh, Bedouins who are citizens of the state and therefore don't pose a demographic threat anymore except by their procreation, as somebody told me on Twitter, because they breed like rabbits. Um, right, because it's okay to be racist in this way. But anyway, I, I digress, and I don't have time. Uh, but they propose, the prior plan proposes to remove 70,000 Palestinian citizens of the state, and in their place, the JNF will plant a forest and the state will build a settlement. In the north, and Liat's slides showed us this, in Iqrit and Bir'an, whose inhabitants live only a few kilometers away from their original village, they have been denied the right to return, not in any way that challenges Israel's demographic majority, but in ways that challenges its claim to righteous conception, despite a 1950 Israeli high court decision that did grant them that right. But in the more recent Israeli high court decision, that right has been denied specifically because of the threat it poses to this narrative. And in, in Akrit and Biram, they will also develop a new settlement. There's, there's more to be said about urban planning in, in Nazareth in ways that demonstrate the ongoing ghettoization of the Palestinian population within the state that mirrors what we can see clearly on maps and the banta, banta, shit. <laughs> Bantustinization. Bantustinization of Palestinians within the West Bank, and the largest Bantustan, of course, of Gaza. Palestinian refugees fundamentally disrupt these national goals. Their return would shatter Israel's Jewish majority. Their presence is a living testament of the of Palestinian narrative and memory, and their historical claims dislocate the ghettoization of Palestinians within Israel today. The absence of refugees, however, does not reverse Israel's policies aimed at diminishing the number of Palestinians, concentrating them geographically, and separating them from one another. In this context, abandoning the right of return is therefore not pragmatic at all. Refugees are not the impediment to establishing a viable peace, its most formidable challenge is Israel's insistence upon Jewish primacy throughout Israel proper as well as the occupied territory. This blatant supremacist motive, however, has not figured into the Oslo peace process. To the contrary there, refugees are simply another negotiation issue, albeit a final status one. Good for them. Israeli officials consider all discussions of refugees as no more than a bargaining chip. Chip. I could never say the CH. I think that's what set me apart. I was, anyway, okay, moving on. Um, but Israeli negotiators see this as a bargaining chip. <laughs> and consider its use by Palestinian negotiators as little more than a threat rather than an assertion of fundamental rights. Meanwhile, there's a bit of truth to that. <laughs> Palestinian negotiators do not sincerely incorporate the rights and aspirations of refugees. Ever since Oslo and the shift of the center of Palestinian decision making from outside of Mandate Palestine to within the occupied territory, refugees no longer constitute a cornerstone of Palestinian demands. This geographic and historic shift has signified at least two things. First, it signifies a shift from a liberation to a state-building movement, whereas the first 
equated self-determination with return, the latter equates self-determination with the development of state institutions, police forces, a central bank, paved roads, and a sewage system. This is not necessary, of course. The idea of statehood and self-determination that includes return is not necessary as enshrined in UN General Assembly Resolution 3236 which upholds both the collective and individual rights of Palestinians. In any case, the most significant thing about this is that um, statehood is meaningless without sovereignty, which is nothing to say about the impediments of statehoods and its limitations and how it, its inability to represent the aspirations of all Palestinians. But the second related shift is one of representation, uh, one that used to represent refugees and exiles, and now primarily represents the aspirations of at most 18% of the Palestinian national body within the occupied territory. I, I, I don't have much time, so I'm going to truncate this fun part. But how then does this translate? How then do Israel's supremacist goals and the Palestinian uh, leadership's desire, political desire for a two-state solution translate into the Oslo Accords uh, as regards refugees. It does so in five main ways. The first is within the legal framework. Whereas UN Resolution 194 in, in paragraph 11 guarantees repatriation, restitution, compensation, and return According to the Oslo Accords, which is dictated by UN, Res UN Security Resolutions 242 and 338, and the conspicuous absence of Security Council Resolution 237, which demanded as a right the return of the 1967 refugees, uh, the, this as a right is marginalized and no longer a meaningful concept. Second, moral responsibility. The Palestinian leadership has suggested that it's willing to do away with all of the right of return altogether if the Israeli leadership would accept moral responsibility for creation of the crisis. But even this, Israel has tried to thwart with calls for, the, for, calls for parity and the moral responsibility of acceptance of a, of a Jewish refugee population, which it only introduced into the Camp David Summit in 2000. As for return to mandate Palestine, both Palestinian and Israeli negotiators are in agreement that at most, the return of refugees would be something between 15 to 125,000 refugees. They are in agreement about this over a 15 year period. Since their agreement on this point, the Israeli negotiating team has truncated this to only the surviving refugees from 1948, which diminishes the 6.6 .6 million refugee population to 30,000 who no longer have the capacity of procreation, although you never know. <laughs> Both negotiating parties are in agreement that the return would be to the occupied uh, territory uh, that would be up to the complete discretion of the Palestinian leadership. But even this uh, right-wing elements of the Israeli government, I don't even know if you could say that after the last elections, given how right everybody is. Uh, but if just historically, uh, many of them have claimed that no, even return of refugees to the occupied territory should be subject to some sort of Israeli oversight. And for compensation, Palestinian leadership has demanded compensation from Israel. Israel has said that this compensation should come from the international community and it is not responsible. But in the final analysis, there is no great divergence between the Palestinian leadership and the Israeli government on issues of return as concerns the marginalization of a fundamental right 
the truncated number of refugees who would return, the, the differences are quite, are quite incremental compared to this bigger picture. And as you have, are well aware, nothing has become of these broad-based outlines since the peace process has completely collapsed, notwithstanding President Obama's heroic and brave efforts <laughs> to resuscitate them recently. Anyway, uh, governments usually fail, and that's when civil society steps in, and that's what Badil and Zuhrot have attempted to do in its comparative uh, study projects. So we have to begin from the point, again, this is the point we're all assuming. It's the assumption of a post-Zionist uh, society. And even if we assume that, all of this is difficult. So let me tell you, uh, Badil and Zuhrot organized comparative study groups to the former Yugoslavia, to Cyprus, and to South Africa. In its trip to South Africa, why would South Africa be relevant? Because by 1913, 80% of the South African population, the majority black population, only had ownership or title to 14% of the land. As a result of the 1950 Group Areas Act, there was forced displacement to ensure racial purity between each of the areas so that they could be colored black and white that resulted in an ethnic cleansing of sorts that we decry in the case of the Group Areas Act, but which we are aspiring to when we to create a two-state solution and land swaps. I digress. Um, in any case, by, by the eve of the fall of apartheid, between two and a half million to three and a half million South Af black South Africans had been forcibly displaced. So they do present a very strong case study along with the other ones. Together, the groups derived a set of guiding principles. Uh, let me just point out a few of the things to you here. The most significant guiding principle is Palestinian choice. Another is sustainability. Another is socioeconomic, socioeconomic equality. And this takes into consideration, but if title doesn't it didn't belong to women. What does that do for women who no longer have spouses who can make those claims, or whose children who can now make different claims because of their different, distinguished, you know, differentiated heads of households? And most significantly, there is no one size fits all for return. It should, in all cases, be a context specific resolution in each case driven by refugee pop, uh, participation. There are three elements that go into how this uh, project should happen. One is working towards return, and this is the work, this is part of the work. This is part of working towards return. Zuhrot's work is at, at the forefront of working towards return and working with communities uh, that need to to, to, to basically be activated and made more familiar. The last line is mis missing, thank you, PowerPoint, but it's forms of action. And here you can see the, this is a proposal that's made about the forms of action within each community. Another element is what happens when return happens exactly. We've proposed two phases, four tracks. I'll get to that in greater detail. That's the one I'm gonna focus on. And what Liat uh, discussed during her allotted time, how to build a new society. So mind you, these are ongoing projects. I want to briefly, in my very limited time, discuss then what are, what uh, the, the second part about return itself. And that is phase one, building localities. In order to engender and nurture return, the vision is that communities begin to rebuild their localities in a way that prepares society for a resuscitation and a transformation of sorts. And this includes rebuilding community space. It includes new economic projects, um, different types of options into 
uh, urban, suburban, and at rural communities, as well as uh, agricultural projects. So I won't, I don't have time to get into all of this, so I'll move on to phase two of implementation. The proposal made is that implementation can happen in four tracks. The first track, known as fast track, um, is that individuals who want to return and give up, they want to return quickly and give up the right to any reparation and compensation packages or at least have just a modest one can do so immediately. That's to accommodate those who would like to pursue an individual track. The second track is for those who still have homes standing, whether or not they're occupied. If they still have homes standing, they're to be a part of track two. And here, if there is an occupant, if there's no occupant, they receive the home as well as a uh, compensation package and are allowed to return. If the house is occupied, the option, optimal approach is a mediation between the two parties, but where title, a reversion of title to the original owner is not contested. Uh, the other principle is that the state itself will be responsible for housing for all people to prevent any homelessness. And the third consideration is that uh, homes that are occupied by members of Israeli regime, as Tom shared so many of those homes are, are not to get preference at all. The third track is one of community reparation. And I think that Inat on the panel before illustrated this vividly with the mapping project, where the communities themselves will have the task and the agency to re-envision what their community would look like as they rebuild it. And so it would be a, a refugee-led uh, project. They can lay claim to particular localities as opposed to particular plots of lands and homes. And it would be uh, implemented with the leadership of the refugee and displaced population itself. The fourth track is the public, public housing track. If you do not have a home standing, you are not returning as an individual, you are not returning as a community, but you would like to return or a community to a particular locality, you will return to public housing um, options. So there's, I won't go much more into that, but I do wanna point out that there are many, many concerns that this raise, raises. The issue of funding is one, as was discussed, Another issue is segregated communities. What's to prevent that in this situation, return would not result in segregation within this new society even? Badil and Zuhrot have proposed incentive packages to present that, and what about those settlements? The question of, do, are they used as homes? Are they destroyed because they've already, they, they, their continuing existence is structural violence upon the land and its indigenous inhabitants? Those questions have not been answered. But again, the fundamental principle is that there would be a mediated solution and that title re would revert to the original owners who get to take part in that mediation. So that this is both an individual and a collective right. All right, questions raised but not answered. Are you surprised that there are many? <laughs> that I won't read to you, but I, you can read them as fast as possible before one, two, three. Okay. <laughs> and other, uh, the other points of actual disagreement have been between, within the group itself, have been between, okay, what does the state look like? Does it need to be a one-state solution to facilitate return? That has been an ongoing, even if you can agree that Palestinians will return, there's still an ongoing disagreement within the groups. I'm not saying there might be disagreement here, but I'm saying within the groups, between them and within them. Another one is, in the worst case scenario, that the occupants of Palestinian homes will not leave voluntarily 
is forced eviction legitimate? That question is also a point of disagreement. Some in the group have said absolutely, others have said absolutely not. And the third is about the allocation of funds. What of those refugees who choose not to return? Should they be offered a larger compensation package to facilitate their sustainable living abroad? Or should their compensation package be lesser in order to facilitate the creation of a new society? Obviously, the presentation raises more question than it offers, questions than it offers answers. And none of it will be possible without the direct participation of Palestinian refugee communities and others to help flesh the, out these proposals even further and to take the discussion of Palestinian refugees beyond political grandstanding to the thoughtful and deliberate discussions necessary to realize the practicality of return. That has been part of the indispens indispensable work of Dr. Salman Abu Sitte, as well as Badil's work since its inception, as part of Zuhrot's work, as part of Ashabaka's work, as part of the work of arenas of speculation, a part of the work of emerging scholars, and many others. But that is not enough. Because even at the point that return is achieved, the struggle does not cease but only enters a new phase. And a phase that is the continual movement towards the achievement of dignity and equality and freedom, which is not a perfect reality, an end of history that we ever reach, but is a constant struggle even amongst societies that have overcome these particular hurdles. So this movement is not an end point but it's a vision with driving principles to which we must continuously aspire and which we must continue to aspire to in all societies. It is thus a constant process, one that is imbued with as much virtue as the attainment of justice itself. And I'm grateful to be part of this challenging work here at this conference and beyond, shoulder to shoulder with each of you. Thank you. here on behalf of Badil and specifically Nadal al Azza, um, who was denied his visa and could not be here, uh, part of our fragmentation. But all of these materials, because of course you're complaining, I didn't go into enough detail and talk too much about other stuff, uh, you can find that in our publications. They were outside as well as on our website. Please do visit. Thanks. Thank you for two amazing presentations. Um, I guess right now we're going, we're going to launch into a very short Q&A uh, uh, for about 15 minutes, so hopefully we'll, we'll have time to take one round of questions. Um, and I, I just to reiterate, I'd like to, to point out again to please uh, maintain um, a civil uh, discourse, respectful discourse, um, <laughs> and, ensure, um, and try and ensure that everyone has a chance to say something as well. Keep questions, questions, please. Uh, so um, if there are only, uh, it seems that there are only two questions right now. Um, so uh, can we, we'll take all of them and then we can sort of answer them. And please say your name and affiliation as well as who your question is directed towards. Um, my name is, can you hear me? Yeah. My, my name is John Spritzler still and uh, I'm the editor of newdemocracyworld.org. Um, uh, I guess my question is directed to both, both the speakers. It's, uh, it's, the question is, is how would they feel about what I'm going to say, <laughs> since we have to play Jeopardy here. Um, you should be a I, lawyer. I think that, that one, perhaps the most important nine-word sentence ever uh, uttered by oppressed and exploited people in the world is the sentence, an injury to one is an injury to all. And I think the importance of this message 
is extremely relevant to, but, but, not, has, but has not been uh, focused and applied in the discussion so far very much to uh, winning the right of return. In order to win the right of return, we need to build a very large mass movement in the world against the, the Zionist denial of right of return. So the question is, how can we build an extremely large mass movement, which ideally would have as much support as possible among uh, people, Jewish people living in, in Palestine? Uh, well, okay, the so, so, so that's the, the question. Can we, can we get to... No, the, the principle is... An injury to one is an injury to all. Okay, we, we heard the principle. Can we move on uh, to the next person? I'm sorry, we have 15 minutes. Next question. Thank you. My name is Mar Can you hear me? My name is Marilyn Levin. I'm national co-coordinator of United National Anti-War Coalition. And I, I'm a, um, wondering how we can have any of this conversation when it sounds like the only principles involved are Israel and the Palestinians. Without the role of the United States and the backing politically, financially, militarily, economically, there would be no, uh, this situation would not exist. The Palestinians would not be in the situation they are and is Zionist Israel would not exist even. When you're talking about reparations, when you're talking about restitution, when you're talking about all of those things, you have to take into account the United States, it seems to me, and also, um, if you're talking about financing the $3 billion a year that the American taxpayers pay, um, in addition to all the, the military equipment, et cetera, um, would go a long way to um, helping, um, helping the refugees. So I'd like your comments on that. Okay, and then, and then um, could we take the third question from this side of the room? Oh, is it? Uh, can you make sure the mics are on? Is it? I can, okay. Hi. 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 Is that loud I can do it. Okay. Um, so, I'm, my name is Tess Wagoner. I'm the president of the Middle East Student Association at Kenyon College, which does not have any requirements for membership. And my question is how we advance toward a civil society like you are imagining, your organizations are imagining, in light of accusations of normalization. Um, and just in case we, we couldn't hear, I'm, I'm just going to repeat that last question. Uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. Um, how do we advance towards civil society um, like the kind that you are imagining um, in, in light of accusations of normalization? And, and I'm imagining in order to avoid normalization yes. as well. Okay. So, not just the accusations. <laughs> so whoever wants to, yeah. Is it okay? Um, well, very difficult, very difficult uh, questions because I think that um, these are the exact questions that we find ourselves. Uh, I'm talking specifically about the first two questions that we, we find ourselves as a whole. Uh, really struggling with, uh, which is, I think the first one is how to, uh, you've asked, how to create a more mass movement. And the second one was what is the role of others by, but the Israelis and the Palestinians, for example, the United States or international communities. And I think the more, uh, the most answer, uh, the most honest answer I have is I, I really don't know. Uh, I can answer that when we think about it in Israel today, uh, what I'm quite sure of is that awareness raising and educational project are simply not enough. So what I'm, um, what I'm quite sure of is that we have, I think that we have to put more, into, more pressure more international pressure, to work with more advocative strategies uh, and in a more proactive ways. Because I can say that in Zuchot we're very much focused on the Israeli public. Um, and even at Zuchot today, we now realize that 
because the name Zuchot is actually in Hebrew, uh, in English, it's remembering uh, in Hebrew. And Zuchot for the past 10 or 11 years uh, is more fo was more focused about bringing the Nakba and bringing the memory of the Nakba to the Jewish-Israeli public. Now, when we shift the focus from working on the memory to working on actual return, we have to assume that other strategies should fall into place because working on memory and working on the past is quite different from working on the future. When you work on the past and on the memory and commemoration and exposing the truth, it's much more reasonable to use strategies like uh, awareness raising and educational strategies and so on. But if we want to work toward the future, we have to use much more practical strategies. And uh, I don't know whether I'm answering the question, but it's quite sure for us that we have to really engage more stakeholders in that process, meaning to work with, in Israel, to work with, more with diplomats, to more, more proactively with international community, and to really, um, and to really emphasize the importance of uh, the Nakba and the return of the Palestinian refugees as part of uh, coming to resolution of the conflict. So I know what we have to, I know that what we have been doing, like acknowledge uh, um, awareness raising and education is not enough and we have to use new strategies. Now what those are, I don't, I don't have a simple answer to that. Okay. <laughs> uh, let me try to answer some of this. Let me start by saying that as, uh, as an organizer who's you know, increasingly treaded into academic waters, one of the things I love about academia is that you can raise a lot of questions and people think you're smart. <laughs> and that's the right thing to do if you raise the right questions, right? And you're applauded for it. In contrast, in politics, aside from the corruption associated with it, right? Um, but aside from that, any politician, even the most pure and, and well-meaning politician, must make choices to the exclusion of others. And so that, and that will be detrimental to many. Unlike in academia, for example, or in our theoretical discussions where we can be very nuanced, when we're making political choices, we're not just choosing something, we're excluding everything else. And so do I think that there will be a solution that satisfies everyone? Absolutely not. Do I think that there are solutions that are better to begin with and that offer a greater potential for growth and development than others? Absolutely yes. And so maybe a way to think about this is to think about what are beginning points that offer the greatest potential for development as opposed to what is the way to meet all these demands and to heal everybody, right? Just a thought. Um, and certainly, 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 had we asked even that question at the beginning of uh, the negotiation process, we would have known that the Oslo-directed uh, peace process was not going to lead us to anywhere, except to where we are. Where we are is not despite Oslo, it's because of it. We can talk about that later, maybe on your campus. Um, <laughs> but on to um, this question of what about how will people live? How, what about, uh, what will the society look like? I think that was a question. I didn't write, what was it? Uh, something about, anyway, maybe nobody asked it, but I should say it. Um, look, at the end of the day, we're dealing with a settler colonial society. And so all precedents of settler colonial societies involved the return of settler colonial populations to their place of origin. And that's not being demanded here because of a reality of new generations that may not feel they have a place to go, or as was raised yesterday, don't have a place to go, like the Misrahim. Um, 
correct? And, and so we can, we can commit ourselves to two principles. One is ensuring that Palestinians have a choice of what they want to do. That as part of redress, that pa all Palestinians get to make that individual choice as a part of collective self-determination. And the second is that there would be no mass forced displacement. Fine, we'll agree to that. And this is the principles that Badil and Zuhrot put forth. But that doesn't mean that suddenly we've rehabilitated a settler colonial society that's been inculcated with supremacist notion since its inception for six decades to think of, peop uh, of a people as a non-people and filth and who won't on their own volition choose to leave. And so there are going to be many unanticipated consequences that we can't map out ourselves, but that surely we can expect as part of this future. And so uh, this question about uh, normalization and how to avoid normalization. Normalization is not a problem of identity politics. I'm not normalizing in this moment because I sit next to a Jewish Israeli who admits to those privileges because of her identity. Normalization is a political project. It's one that chooses to dismiss the structural violence and the structural inequities upon which uh, discrimination and inequality are uh, recreated daily in an effort to uh, in an effort to tolerate one another in this politics of tolerance and that's so I don't think that there should be a problem of normalization if there's a clear politics to which you are committed and then this thing about the US absolutely the US is part of all of this the, the U.S. wasn't part of this discussion in particular. It was because this was Badil and Zuhrot led delegations about what should happen. But no discussion would happen about the U.S.'s role as a third party in this conflict without dealing with its settler colonial realities. And so it would be very shallow to bring the U.S.'s role into this and what it owes to the Palestinians without discussing what it owes to its indigenous populations and what we owe as descendants of those settlers. So that wasn't an oversight. That wasn't an oversight. I think, I, I think that's it. Okay, um, unfortunately due to limited time, we're gonna have to cut off the Q&A, but thank you again to both of our panelists. And please take a five minute coffee break because the next panel will be beginning immediately.